Good afternoon. Uh, it's really exciting to be able to speak to you about Microsoft Research India, which is uh, a lab that I head. We are based in Bangalore. The lab was set up 20 years ago. In fact, today is Jan 8th. In four days, in January 12th, we will be out of our teenage and we'll be 20, right? Uh, and the 20 years we've been around, uh, I'll tell you about some of the work we have done. But what I'm most proud about is the set of people we have attracted to the lab and we have trained at the lab and that have gone out to do great things, right? Um, and some of the awards that I've called out here are examples of things that uh, was the result of the work people did at the lab. In some cases, these awards uh, are examples where, you know, we are the only industrial lab where people have won these awards. Usually academics and others win it. We also train a lot of talent. Uh, we hire people as postdocs, we hire them as research fellows, after which they've gone to do PhDs, become faculty, uh, do startups, and I will talk about some of those examples. Uh, in terms of uh, the areas of work, we work on AI ML, which is uh, uh, obviously a very important area. We also work on systems that enable AI ML to be built. Right? Think of managing your GPU resources efficiently. Think about managing energy efficiently. Right? Satya talked about tokens per dollar per watt. So efficiency in systems is very, very important. We focus on that. We work on foundational work in theory and secure computing, cryptography, and so on. If you're a hospital with data, there's a startup that's got a model, AI model. You want to evaluate the startup's model on your data, but you don't want to share your data. How do you do this computation securely? We can do that. Uh, the other thing that's particularly unique about the lab that Microsoft has in India is work with the larger ecosystem, society. And we call it technology and empowerment, and I'll spend a bit of time talking about that. The common thread through all of our work is to have impact at scale. How do we take ideas that are in the lab and get it in the hands of millions and tens of millions of people? Uh, and the way we do that is through openness. We publish a lot, we write lots of papers, we open source a lot of our technologies, right? So if you go to GitHub, you will find uh, software for a lot of our projects. So that's sort of our way of engaging with science and the scientific community. Now, sometimes those ideas and those technologies get picked up, and sometimes by our own product teams at Microsoft, sometimes by other companies, and they're able to sort of then uh, take it and sort of build it into things that people can use. So that's really sort of industry leveraging it. But there are cases where there isn't an existing vehicle to take what we have created in the lab and scale it up. And that's where we work with the ecosystem to create new pathways for scaling. And I'll give you some examples uh, in the next slide. And this is like a very uh, sort of summary slide. There are many, many examples. One of the things we have done in the lab is actually we have spun off companies, which is very unusual for a research lab uh, in, a, in a private company to be doing. But we have taken projects and we have actually spun them off as companies where people just take the technology, they leave, and uh, uh, they built uh, very, very interesting companies that are you know, uh, having a, 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 a huge societal impact. And I'll talk about one of them, Karia. We work with existing startups. So just yesterday, the announcement, if you've seen, we are very excited to be working with Physicswala on taking some of the math reasoning work we're doing and sort of combining it with their uh, uh, wonderful offerings and you know, uh, scaling that way. We work with larger companies, NGOs, and obviously government and academia. And the other thing we have done is we have been a crucible of talent, right? I would say at least a dozen companies have come out of people who were at the lab, either through the spin-offs of our projects or talent that went and sort of did other companies, right? So all of these things we have done. Let me give you a couple of examples of projects where we scale it beyond the lab in different ways. One is Karya, which is really about dignified digital work. So the question is, how do you create AI-enabled work for underserved communities? You know, think of a security guard or you know, someone sort of who's a homemaker who have plenty of time and they want to make productive use of their time. How can they do productive work? AI and the need for data and labeling and evaluation provides a unique opportunity where someone who's got a half an hour of time, they've got a device, they can actually do something useful that contributes to creating data sets and you know, uh, improving AI through the data. So with that in mind, we created this Karia digital platform as a research project in our lab, uh, you know, designed to be mobile first, to support local language, chat-like interaction, and also disconnected operation. So even if you don't have internet connection, you can still do the work. In fact, when we start, first started this project, we called it Digital MNREGA. MNREGA obviously is the government program for employment, 
we thought of it as a digital form. It was very successful as a research project. The question then was, how do we scale it? How do we take, to, take it to uh, you know, uh, a million people or beyond? We decided to spin it off as a company. And the company is also called Karya. So the project was called Karya. The company is also called Karya. And they have grown uh, uh, significantly since they were spun off. Now they are in pretty much every state in India. And they were featured on the cover of Time magazine uh, a year or two ago. Uh, and you know, they're really touching the lives of lots of people and giving them dignity through digital work. Uh, a different example is a project we did called HAMS on road safety. Again, this is motivated by the situation in the country where uh, roads here are particularly unsafe. Uh, India sadly has a higher rate of uh, road fatalities than many other countries. And part of the reason, and this is data from a uh, uh, foundation called Save Life, is that people uh, often get licenses without being tested properly. Right? So the question is, how can we use technology to fix this? And so that was where HAMS came in. We, about five years ago, we launched automatic driver license testing with just a smartphone. So if you can see on the picture there, on the dashboard is a smartphone. There's a driver. That's it. There's no inspector. right? And the smartphone, through AI, administers the test. We went live. We launched in Dehradun in 2019. And since then, this is in about 28 RTOs, over 200,000 tests automatically administered, and also very unexpected benefits. Like during the pandemic, for example, neither the drivers nor the inspectors want to be sitting with each other. right? So there was a benefit in having testing without really having that human proximity. Uh, this has been a collaboration with Maruti Suzuki's uh, CSR arm, IDTR, and also a small company in Hyderabad. So again, we work with the ecosystem to take what we build in the lab and grow it. And this uh, received recognition both from the state government in Uttarakhand and also made it to the shortlist for the uh, PMS award. Uh, so what are we doing today? Uh, we're really thinking of uh, the opportunity as sort of building a platform for population scale co-pilots. So how do we take the benefits of AI to a billion people? Right? That's really the, uh, the thing. And we're looking at the entire stack from compute. How do you use GPUs and energy efficiently to data? I talked about Karya to multilingual support. And I'll talk about that briefly. You know, India obviously is a country with many, many languages. And uh, you, you know, if your AI is not available in your language, it is less useful. Applications, you know, we, are, we have uh, things on education, agriculture, he uh, healthcare, and so on. And also user interface, right? So let's say uh, someone is blind or they are deaf. How do they leverage AI with the same richness that someone who doesn't have uh, that problem can, right? Uh, so we are looking at things uh, across the stack. Let me give you a couple of examples. So Siksha is a co-pilot for teachers that we started in the lab uh, two or three years ago where you know, we recognize that teachers are the backbone of the education system, and they are seriously overworked. Right? They have large class sizes. They have a lot of things to do. The question is, how can you enable teachers? And if you can enable teachers through AI, one teacher can serve 100 students. Right? So you get that amplification. So we build a six-shop co-pilot that, uh, that is grounded in the curriculum of that board or that state. So for example, in Karnataka, the Karnataka State Board. And, uh, uh, the teacher can create lesson plans with just simple prompts, and they can get you know, uh, you know test sets, whatever they need to uh, help their teaching. And this has now been launched across all districts in Karnataka to 1,000 teachers, working with the Sikshana Foundation, which is an NGO. And we are very, very happy to then take this uh, beyond. Right? In fact, we have talked to um, uh, India Emission, and we are, we are exploring opportunities to take this beyond. Another example, this is healthcare, is expert of the loop bots. Right? So, just like teachers are overworked, doctors are overworked, right? India's doctors to patient ratio is kind of low. So if patients have questions, a doctor is simply not able to answer all of them in a timely way. So the idea here is to use AI to generate answers, but at the same time to make sure that an expert like a doctor or nurse vets the answer. And uh, uh, with very simple uh, uh, sort of interface, they can make corrections. And then that gets added to the knowledge base, right? So essentially, you get the amplification scaling of AI, but you get the accuracy that comes from an expert vetting, right? And that combination has been deployed uh, in the case of cataract patients with Shankara Eye Hospital in Bangalore, and also in Rajasthan with the ASHA workers, right? So these are two examples. Uh, there are many more that we can go after. And finally, multilingual systems. You know, uh, if you look at the performance of these LLMs, they're generally best in English because that's where most of the data that's been used for training is from. In fact, the pie chart shows for GPT-3, most of the, the blue stuff is all English and a few other languages. So 
you know, obviously, we need to uh, look beyond English. So we have built this platform for evaluation uh, across languages, keeping cultural nuance in mind, and also having career workers, our own project workers, uh, do the evaluation, right? So the people uh, in the country are doing the evaluation. And then we are then fine tuning uh, models like the five model from Microsoft to support Indian languages and other languages much better. So con to conclude, uh, I think with AI, you have the opportunity for the first time to tailor technology to meet the needs of the user. It's not that someone designs software and then you have to use it as it is. If you have a particular workflow, AI can be tuned to your workflow. Obviously, there are technical challenges to be solved, and that's where research is exciting. The open approach we follow at Microsoft Research really enables us to work with the ecosystem you know, in, a, in, a, in a mutually beneficial way. We benefit from the ecosystem. The ecosystem benefits from us. And just yesterday, we announced the AI Innovation Network with the idea of sort of scaling this to the next level, you know, working with PhysicsWala and hopefully other startups and other organizations in really sort of uh, building on this. Thank you.